why a woman should never pursue a man. Hi, I'm Auntie Boyd, founder and creator of the Magnetize Your Man Method, and welcome back to the Magnetize Your Man online retreat today with love and dating expert, Chris Sider. Hey, Chris. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm so excited to speak with you today because sometimes my women are like, I don't want to hear that, right? But when they actually hear it from a man, it's a, it's a different perspective, right? Like, well, maybe there is something to that, right? Oh, that makes sense when I look at the male psychology. So really excited to have you here. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting topic. And I consider myself a bit of an expert because most of the time I'm dealing with people going through breakups, right? And not in all of these situations should these women be trying to get back with their exes. So we have seen lots of different behaviors and I have some really messed up stories to share here that will be entertaining for you if you stick around until the end. <laughs> oh, I love it. It reminds me of like Greg Barron's book. Like, you know, like he's just not that into you. Yeah, like, right. The they, 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 they like made a movie about that, right? Yeah. I don't know if that was like based on the book or, or I never saw the movie, but I do know the movie existed. Right, totally, totally. Well, awesome. But before we go there, I just want to tell the listener a little bit about who you are. So Chris Sider, again, like Chrissy already said, the founder of ex boy Friend Recovery has been helping thousands of brokenhearted individuals win their access back for over a decade. And one successful strategy he often recommends is the no contact rule, which may or we may not talk about today. He also has generated over, well, probably more than 100,000 downloads at this point. And his YouTube has over 70,000 subscribers. And he has been featured in countless publications, including outlets such as Fox, Hollywood Life, and of course, is like, he's the man. He's the man. He's done the research. Hey, that's it. That's all you need to say. I'm the man. I like it. He's the man. If nobody can do it. Chris Stroke can. the ego. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome, Chris. So let's dive into that, right? Like why a woman should never pursue men. Because so when women come to me all the time, they get a little frustrated because we're sort of in this age of, you know, emancipation and equality and all those things. So let's actually talk about while in dating, especially in the initial sort of like more the vulnerable and rough stages, right? It doesn't really work. Yeah. I think most of the things that I probably going to talk about today are going to be based around if you're kind of already in a relationship. Um, we can't talk about some of the things based on like pursuing, but probably I have more expertise with regards to like, look, if you're in a relationship or you have been in a relationship or you notice some of these type of signals, steer clear. So consider like everything that auntie and I are about to talk about, like red flags, like there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You should stay away from this person. Okay. So the very first red flag, if you will, I think is overly controlling behavior. And I don't, I think there's a, there's a certain element of um, like where it's kind of okay in certain circumstances, but I'm talking about excessive controlling behavior. So I'll give you like an example. My wife actually, uh, she always tells me the story of her very first boyfriend and her very first boyfriend was very uh, emotionally insecure with the relationship, but he was very controlling with her because he was afraid of getting hurt. He was a very, she's a very beautiful girl. She gets a lot of attention from other guys. So he gets jealous and controlling, right? But it got to controlling to the point where she would just be using the bathroom and he'd stand outside the bathroom door, making sure she's not texting anyone. So if you're experiencing controlling behaviors on that level, maybe steer away from that guy. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, totally. And the same is also true, right? Like when you look at when a woman pursues a man, like she's also controlling as well, right? Because they always say, well, what had you attract this guy in the first place, right? Where, where do you like to control the situation? Where are you not fully trusting? Yeah. And I think actually, you know, not to bring up attachment styles again, but it's you and I's favorite topic to talk about. Uh, I think a lot of the controlling behaviors stem from anxious sort of uh, insecure attachments inside. You know, you're very um, your whole life is wrapped up in this relationship or your whole life is wrapped up around getting this partner. And if things aren't going your way, you have a tendency to kind of control things to, to ensure that you can curb some of the anxious behavior or anxious feelings you're feeling inside. And I think like, 
you know, it, it's not just men that are experiencing this to your point. Some women can turn men off completely by acting this way when they are pursuing a relationship. So it's kind of both ends of the spectrum. So, I mean, even, you know, just to kind of turn it around, you can have some men um, literally blow up or freak out on your grow jealous if you don't respond immediately. So like, let's imagine you're pursuing a guy, you kind of like the guy, and then something in life happens, you have to step away from your phone, you have to stop texting them. And then you come back to your phone and it's blown up with like 50 messages and they're each getting more like worrisome and angering at you because you're not responding to them right away. This is controlling type of behavior. Probably not a good person to be in a relationship with. And you know, you, you're speaking actually this is something very significant here, just that they're insecurely attached because what the control is really coming from is, is really from that lack of trust that you just talked about, right? Well, think about if I trust, I'm like, okay, people are doing their life, you know, she's probably doing this or that or the other, or he's doing, you know, whatever. There's like this trust, right? Like life is good, right? Like I'm safe in this world. But when I don't have that, then I'm constantly projecting onto the man or the partner or the woman that I'm dating, right? Like that, you know, they're out to get me and they're gonna betray me and they're gonna make fun of me behind my back. And so on and so forth. Yeah. And I think weirdly enough, the only thing that can sort of you you can use as a proving ground in that situation is to literally see what silence does to the person. Like when we're left alone, there's only one person we can have a conversation with and that's ourselves. Right. And so if your mind is coming up with insecure anxious type of thoughts, like, well, what if she's finding someone new or what if you know, she's cheating on me or, or what if she doesn't like me and they're re and that's their first reaction as opposed to just simply thinking like a secure person would, Oh, they're busy at work. Usually you're going to find. And I think like what probably we need to talk about with this is how most men at first do a pretty good job of disguising this. It sometimes takes a little while for this type of behavior to come out. You know, you have to be talking to them for a little while. Sometimes uh, men you'll find will disguise it completely until you're in a relationship with them. And that's the whole adage of like, you know, how you should like, uh, there's a lot of different schools of thought. So I'm not saying one's better than the other, but there's a school of thought that says you should live together with the person before you marry them, because you'll kind of get to see what they're truly like as you live together. And it's kind of the same thing, just on a smaller level uh, with the controlling behaviors. Like sometimes it's important to leave the guy that you like alone just to see how he's going to react. Will he freak out? Absolutely. Right. It's like a good point. Cause I always say the real attachment style actually shows in the absence, right? Because when mm. we're in the presence of the person, we'll all look secure. We're all like, Chris, what attachment problem are you talking about? It's, I it's so the whole scary. dating profile of <laughs> misnomer, right? You know, I see like a lot of women trying to make their dating profile so perfect. And what ends up happening is they put all of their perfect pictures up. They look perfect. And then when they come to the date in person, the guy almost has a letdown because he has this idealized version of how he's expecting you to be. And if you're not perfectly matched up with that, um, he feels like he's been lied to. So it's kind of like a, like a weird sort of uh, connection there. Yeah. And that's, that's such a good point. You know, it's like really, and you also see uh, like, so interesting that this is actually all based on like unconscious expectations it is. and mm -hmm. uncommunicated unconscious expectations. Isn't right. it? I mean, it, it is, uh, I feel like a lot of attraction is that way though. Um, most people in my experience, they don't do a great job communicating up front, at least coming into my orbit. So you need to understand that most of the women that come into my or orbit are not secure attached people. They are very anxious attached people who want their exes back. And oftentimes their exes are avoidance. So that kind of creates a whole nother layer here. But, uh, I find oftentimes the anxiously attached people are not, they're, they're, they're actually sometimes overly good at 
communicating their needs, but not at first sometimes. I don't know. It's, it's this weird paradox that kind of exists within both attachment styles, but I think we, we should probably move on to like another, um, another thing. We get, we're, we, we'll we be sitting here so talking about controlling yeah. behaviors for like for 50 minutes here. So yeah, another big red flag. And this is actually a personal story um, that kind of stumbled across and it was the first time I've ever seen this behavior, but it's, it's kind of interesting is revenge based behaviors. So this may be a little bit of a, of a unique take on it, but like I said, most of the time I'm dealing with women who have gone through breakups. Most of these women oftentimes want their exes back, even in cases when they shouldn't be trying to get their exes back. There was a case of a woman in our private Facebook support group who we kind of advised Sort of like, look, you have this anxious attachment style. Let's work on making you appear more secure, you know, and then sort of like rebuild your life in that way, right? So she's doing all the all the things she, she's doing. She implements a no contact rule, which is kind of like a purposeful, like, hey, I'm taking a break from you to focus on me. So after her no contact rule, she gets in touch with the guy. And the guy literally does not say anything to her. He sends her a picture of him doing let's say romantic intimate things with another woman. So in these cases, if you have someone who is very revenge filled, almost like they're, they're trying to hurt you for a perceived wrong, this is not a good sign. And one of the best ways you can determine if this is a guy that is like this is to pay attention to the types of stories he's telling you about specifically stories in which he has been wronged because the mature thing to do is really not necessarily to for, forget, but to forgive and move on. But if a guy tells you a story while you're pursuing him about this guy or girl or ex or whatever, who, who hurt his feelings and he got her back, it's your red flag should go up because what's to stop you from being the next story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's always like, be aware how he talks about other people, because it's just a matter of time until he starts that same level of projection. And I think the same is also true when a man leaves you, like when he's, when he's actually in another relationship and he leaves uh, the woman for you. And I was like, well, you know, it's kind of good and bad news because how do you know he's not going to do that with you? Exactly. In yeah, whatever, I mean that, six months all that, year, you know? that That's the paradox that I often face when dealing with clients, especially with clients who have exes who have moved on to someone new and they're wanting that ex back. Um, and another interesting aspect of this is sometimes uh, women are so desperate to get their exes back that they are willing to cross their moral lines and try to get the ex to cheat on the other woman. But the the thing that I always try to explain to these, these women who are trying to create this behavior is the fact that like, look, if you literally are successful and what you're trying to achieve here, he's moved on to another relationship. Maybe it's a rebound, maybe it's not, but you're able to get him to cheat on that new person with you. He is literally proving to you that this, he's the type of person that is willing to do that to a woman and you will probably be next. So if if a guy is willing to do that, that to me is also a big red flag because, you know, they're just kind of a, they're a bad guy. Let's just say no qualms about it. It's not a good thing. Not healthy relationship behavior. And you know what you're also talking to is actually this whole distortion around power. So interesting. I was literally just talking with a client about that last night, right? When there's all those like power struggles and those, those, those power games and plays which basically, again, also comes from insecurely attached. Because again, like somebody who is securely attached trusts, right? So if I trust, I'm never out of balance where I didn't trust. I never gave my power away. So I never have to abuse the power because I never gave it away. So I never have to swing to the opposite extreme to compensate for all the times when I was inauthentic, when I actually gave my power away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, we, we can go days and days talk, you know, it, it's interesting because we started with revenge and we kind of, and that's just the way auntie and I kind of work. We just kind of, uh, 
we're gonna do like one of those marathons. We're just, we're right. just on Instagram just, and we're just see, like we just go. You see, you, we start on a topic and see where we end. I think that would be a fascinating uh, study. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, uh, so the next big red flag that I have sort of on the list here is actually sabotaging your own dreams. So one of the things that we've seen is sometimes people who are extremely control freaks don't want you to have your own dreams. They don't want you to really have your own life. They want to be in control of that. And so if you're finding this type of behavior in a real, I mean, usually you're not going to see this before you actually enter into a relationship. This is more of like you are in a relationship with someone you have this dream that you've always wanted to achieve, but they're somehow preventing you from achieving that dream. I think I see this probably more than you do because I'm dealing with breakups and oftentimes broken relationships, but I'm sure you've seen something like this where you have like an, an ex or something who is so controlling to the fact that the woman kind of lost herself in the relationship, lost her entire identity into the relationship. And what, what's interesting is from an attachment standpoint, you know, attachment styles are kind of fluid. You can be a secure attached person and then enter into a relationship with an anxious attached person or avoidant attached person and start to take on those characteristics because it's kind of, they're driving you crazy and you're, you're learning your attachment style through interpersonal connections with other people. And so what often we see here is like, if you're with an anxious person, an anxious guy, he's going to want to like take control of your entire life. So pay attention to those types of behaviors as well. This is actually really interesting as I'm just reading The Power of Attachment, by the way, if you haven't haven't read it, Chris, it's phenomenal because it's really like discussing who has influence over who. So when there's like a securely attached person, like what's the likelihood that they, you know, the other person is either avoidant or anxious. What's the likelihood that they actually become like anxious or avoidant, right? Like what they weren't yeah. for versus how likely are they to pulling the anxious into the secure Right. It truly is a push pull type thing. I'm actually kind of curious. Do you, it, it, what, what's the pre prevailing thought there on what, what so style he, wins out? He framed it more as that actually um, that is secure. Now I think it really has something to do with also like how, how far you are in your personal development, how willing are you to taking on different perspectives? Certainly how willing are you to be wrong? Right. But she was definitely arguing more on the side that, um, that the other person's actually going to feel more secure because the, the secure person doesn't need like proofs and like, you know, she doesn't, they need, need to justifications. So they just almost like, so when I met my husband, I was like more anxiously attached. He is definitely more secure. I could just go through my emotions, right? Like I would just push him away, ignore him all night. I mean, just all the stories that you've been telling. I did all of that. And he's like, okay, let me, let me know when you're back. Right. Cause he was not taking it personal because he remember he has this natural sense of well-being that secure attachment styles have, right? He trusts the world. He, he knows that love is safe. So it must be just something she's going through. You know what I mean? Must not have anything to do with me. Um, well, however, he did set boundaries. So if I would have said, and this is what I meant with the like, how, how far developed are you too in your personal development? There were moments where he was like, you know what? You're not going to do that again. And I know if I had done it again, he would have walked or like at least it would have had some sort of more serious consequences because the secure attachment has self-respect, right? So they will not sacrifice themselves. They will not allow somebody to disrespect them repetitively. If it's like a test here or there, right? Okay, go for your emotions, right? But if that happens all the time, you know, they're like, well, you know what? I respect myself too much. I love myself too much. I know there's abundance out there and I'm walking. Does that make sense? Chris? Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. I was actually just going to back you up. I mean, um, I haven't read that book, but that's now top of the, the to read list. Oh. Um, but what I can draw from is personal experience. So one of the things that we kind of started noticing with our clients, uh, specifically in the years 2019 through 2020, we were doing a lot of studies on what are women who are successfully able to win exes back. And 
80% of these exes are avoidant type attached people. So fearful avoidance, um, dismissive avoidance, all, all kind of the avoidant sort of people is usually the exes and most of clients are anxious. So you're not really getting any kind of the secure injection into the equation. And one of the things that we noticed is when we started trying to advise our clients to act more securely, and it's not the type of thing where you can kind of fake it till you make it. You literally have to become secure. They started to have really incredible results because what was another really interesting finding is we found that avoidance often wouldn't come back until they had enough space to where they felt like they could uh, have nostalgic feelings about the relationship. Cause a lot of times we're, we're noticing like avoidance often they have, they, they really love the phantom X type mentality. So they love having the one that got away mm-hmm. always, always in the background. Right. So weirdly enough, when we would, we, we would take our anxious clients because 90% of our clients are very anxious. They are the ones who are, not necessarily controlling, but they're the ones who would blow up their ex's phone, beg for their ex back, do all the ridiculous behaviors. When we sit them down and say like, look, from now on, you're not trying to get your ex back. You're trying to outgrow your ex, literally teaching them the tools they need to look at the world in a more secure way, set those boundaries that you're talking about. All of a sudden, the the avoidant ex would take an interest in them because they would get those nostalgic feelings because they had enough space to have those nostalgic feelings. Now it's a different, the, it's a different sort of solution on getting an ex back versus keeping a relationship together. Because oftentimes we found that while we were teaching the anxious people to be more secure and that secure sort of thing, almost had this gravity that drew the avoidant person to them that necessarily, that wasn't necessarily enough to keep that relationship surviving because half of the people that we would get back together would break up again. And it goes to what you were saying. You need to be like full in on the personal development side of things. You need to truly like, you don't need to be pretending to be secure. You need to be secure. And if you are not secure, those anxious tendencies begin to bubble up again. And I think that's what we found happening a lot. And that's really the struggle we have with our, with our, clients really, because it's not a function. We've kind of figured out, okay, this is what really works to make men interested in and in reconnecting, not in every situation, but we've sort of figured that out. The challenge now is how do you keep them together? And really it starts with that personal development growth of becoming secure, mm-hmm. not faking secure. Yeah, that's so good. And what that actually means is relating with security to your insecurities because women always say oh that means I'm no longer insecure no no no, that's not what it means it means that you now speak to your insecurity right that you say you know what I'm, this is my first date or you know or maybe if, even if you're in a relationship right like you come home and you're like you know I could pretend all is fine or I could just say you know what I do feel like a little insecure right now and yeah you know what's fascinating, Carl Jung would call that like integrating the shadow. I don't know if you've ever uh, uh, researched that, but for anyone who doesn't know, like Carl Jung had this belief that each one of us has like this dark side to us and we repress the dark side. And so his whole point was like, if you want to transcend, if you want to become more secure, you need to acknowledge the fact that you have this dark side. Otherwise, if you suppress it long enough, it can take control of you and you can project it onto other people because, and I see this unfortunately a lot with people, not just clients, but people in my day-to-day life where they're always willing to blame other people for the problems. They're not willing to realize like, Hey, you know, um, like a common example, I'll even use myself as an example. Right. So I remember early, earlier this month, I was driving home And I saw this kid walking and he was like really confident, but there was something about him. Yeah. Everyone has it. There's something about the person that just bugs them. And I remember thinking like, why do, why does he bug me? And I think it was because he was very confident in the way he was walking. And for whatever reason that day, I didn't feel that confidence. So I projected it onto him and was like, that's the shadow talking. So I think a lot of what you're talking about is sort of like in line with that, having that dialogue with some of your insecurities, some of your anxious tendencies, not necessarily like repressing them because if you repress them long enough, they can come up, but just acknowledging, Hey, I have this fact and I'm going to be in control of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what Brody was saying too, when we were started to date to date, right? Cause we were talking about when you already have someone in mind, 
um, I, I told him, I said, look, you know, uh, I have something called as a working model. It's called the anxious attachment style. Here's how it shows up. And it's again, it's just having the ownership over it, right? Because the moment I say it, he knows that I have perspective to it, that, that it's not ruling me, right? Because if it's ruling me, I just act on it. I'm not going to tell you I have this anxious attachment style. I'll just become needy and I just become go into future anticipation land and all the things, right? Yeah. Um, awesome. What's, what's the next one? Chris, yeah. So uh, the next one is sort of in line with what we just talked about with like sabotaging your own dreams, but there are also some men who will literally isolate you. And I guess this is kind of, I, I'm actually interested to get your take, like from an attachment style perspective of what you think. I think this is probably more of an anxious type of an attachment style, like a controlling behavior, but like isolating you to the point where they're not allowing you to have friends or not, not allowing you to have your own life. Um, like what, what I'm actually really curious, what is your take on like why someone would do that? And I think this actually goes back to the possessiveness, right? This definitely goes more towards the anxious attachment style, because remember, they think they will lose the other person. So even if they have them short term, right, they think they're going to something is going to happen. So they try to eliminate all the circumstances, right? They have literally friends like that where the husband was not allowed to go out again or even like see friends because for the friends, for the friends, not, I'm not talking about the woman. I'm not talking about, right. But he was not allowed to, to watch certain shows anymore where there was women in bathing suits, right. So like Baywatch or something like that. Back wow. Then. That is, that's pretty excessive. It's pretty, it's pretty right. But this is like, you're really super hyper, um, hyper, hyper, um, anxious attachment style. And then also like, no, you can't go anywhere, right? You can't drive anywhere because you could either meet someone or you could hurt yourself. So there's this constant worry that goes with that. And it, only the anxious has that because the anxious has this constant fear to lose it. Because remember, life is like a gamble for them, right? So they're like, oh, if it's a gamble, then I got to eliminate all the possibilities how something could go wrong. Yeah. So, I mean, I think to like build off of what you just said, we're trying to focus this, this uh, conversation more about like, like you should never pursue a man like this. But when we're, when we're dealing with complicated things like this, you know, like the possessive aspect of like, Hey, I'm going to isolate you in this way that you can't have your own friends. You can't watch your own shows. You can be the, the bathing suit thing, which is just hilarious. Um, I think like a lot of people sitting there will be like, well, how do I, how do I find that out? Like, how do I, because like we said, most men will disguise these type of behaviors, but I think probably this is why it's really important for you to recognize severe anxious people um, leading up to the relationship. So what are some of the strategies that you think people can use on Tia to identify this level of an anxious person as you're pursuing them. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Because I think, again, there's two categories. There's like the, the overly ob obsessed one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think you can really tell because there's sort of like this, uh, this very, I see this right now with a client of mine and he already like kind of like tells her like what, how she should think about the ex relationship that she had. So he's like, Oh, I totally get it. Yeah. No, don't let that happen to you. And so there is this, it looks a little bit like the protector, right? But the mm -hmm. secure would do that because the secure would be also with himself, right? So he wouldn't be like, he would be like, I'm getting to know the woman, right? Like, oh, cool, tell me more. That would be like more curiosity versus like telling her, there's more like a telling, there's almost like a commanding. This is how it is, okay. this is the situation you're in. That's what I would say is like one of the um, markers that I would look for where I'm like, eh, I don't know if I like that because- there's a lot of assumptions and assumptions usually comes from the anxious attachment style. Yeah. Yeah. I think also maybe like uh, most men, at least what we've noticed specifically, we have this thing um, when we're trying to teach women, like how to get back in touch with, uh, with their ex after a no contact rule. Um, we looked and did all these studies on like what the most like uh, 
I guess, best text messages were to get like high responses. And we found the very best text message to get a response from your ex is something we call the damsel in distress text message because it taps into the hero complex aspect of a man. So I think actually what you're referring to here of like the protector role is that hero and com- uh, uh, the hero complex aspect that a man will have. But I think what you're saying is even more insightful is the fact that they're not going to necessarily solve your problems. They're not going to order you at first, like this is how you should deal with it. They're going to suggest it lightly at first. But I think maybe what you should pay attention to is if that escalates, if they start saying like, they start being very adamant about doing that. You, Because I think like really what we're looking for here and what you should be paying attention to if you're like looking for these really red flag signs are excessive avoidant uh, tendencies, red flags at first and uh, excessive anxious ones, but they don't appear excessive. So what you're looking for is like an escalation of those behaviors. So I think really your prerequisite, if you want my advice, like I can sit here and say like, yeah, stay away from the narcissist. Like I've got the list here. Uh, Stay away from the narcissist. If he's gaslighting you, if he's cruel to you, if there's abuse going on, if there's uh, addiction in, in, in there, all of these things are not usually going to present themselves in the pursuing stage because I think they're going to hide that because they're aware subconsciously, you know, that's a turnoff. But what I don't think you can turn off is the slow escalation of the, you know, uh, insecure behaviors, the insecure attachment behavior. So if like, like anyone listening to this, if you want my take on like how to identify, like, look, and we can argue about like, uh, misrepresenting certain things and being like, well, every man is imperfect. I think there, there needs to be something built in where you realize no one is perfect, but if you're finding slow escalation of insecure behaviors, it's not usually a good sign. Cause what we really want is for you, even if you're like an anxious person, you want to get um, into a relationship with a score person because you can learn from, they, they can almost like show you the way of how you can be more secure and you can kind of help each other in that way. Um, I guess that's the, to put a big point on it. That would be my big advice for anyone. Look for escalation of insecure behaviors. Oh, so good. And Chris, I could talk to you forever. I think the the minds are exploding of the women listening so i know we are like at the end of uh of this particular interview i know we have like so many more coming that's for sure and for the women <laughs> who are like gosh i really want to learn more from chris and so much so many insights that i had no idea what's the best step to get in contact with you what's your free gift that you have for the ladies to continue this journey with you yeah, probably the best place to get in contact with me is to go to my website, www.exboyfriendrecovery.com. And on the website, we have like uh, a couple of free quizzes. Uh, probably the most popular one is like, what are your chances of getting your ex back? Because that's really what we're focused on. But if you're interested in just simply uh, learning more about attachment styles or the inner workings of what works and how you should heal from a breakup, there's basically the entire website is just some of my best stuff given away for free. But the free gift that Auntie is talking about is probably the quiz. So uh, all you literally need to do if you're interested in that is go to the homepage of our website. So just type in www.exboyfriendrecovery.com and then follow the prompts that you see there. It's pretty self-explanatory. I love it. And of course, as usual, the link is right below this video. Well, Chris, as usual, it's been a delight. It's been such a treat. I'm sure the women are going to watch this over and over again. It's like, what was that again? Right? Because you really find yourself in some of those stories. I have certainly found myself in some of those stories. And thank you for sharing that from the masculine perspective. Welcome. Thanks for having me. All right, ladies. Now we'll talk to you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.